The last third of the 19th century proved to be an extraordinary era in Hungary. Previous decades and centuries have provided very little peacetime. And in wartime, as we know, all muses fall silent. Now with a failed revolution safely behind it, the country was at last able to enjoy a time of peace, prosperity and construction. For the first time in a long time, knowledge and determination no longer had to be directed into survival and rebellion, but could provide the power required to plan, create and build. Eighteen sixty seven saw the birth of the Austro Hungarian compromise between the previously hostile Austrian throne and Hungary. These two countries now came together along with several other territories to form a united empire. This was to become an age of improvement and advancement. And it was not long before the construction of a modern opera house in Budapest was raised by none other than the then Prime Minister, Count Gyula Andrási. Six excellent architects stood ready for the race. Among them, Miklos Ibil, who had overseen construction of St. Stephen's Basilica, Imre Steindl, architect of Budapest's magnificent parliament building, and the Viennese architect Ferdinand Fellner, who amongst other projects had designed the building of Vixenhaz in Budapest. Ibil's architectural design won by a majority, Detailed preparation could now begin under the watchful eye of the Vice President of the Municipal Board of Public Works, Baron Fridjash Podmanitsky. <laughs> The overall ruler of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, His Imperial Highness Franz Joseph I, Emperor of Austria and King of Hungary, donated two million gold forints from the treasury to fund construction of the Opera House, with the strict instruction that it should be a little smaller than its counterpart in Vienna. <laughs> Miklos Ibel redrew his original design and reduced the size of the auditorium by removing one balcony level, which gave the building a more balanced overall appearance. The building also differed from the Vienna Opera House in that, instead of a massive monolithic facade, it welcomed visitors with an elegant entrance topped with a grand balcony. As Vienna had stipulated conditions, so did the city of Budapest. With a virtually equal sum, Budapest stated that all those working on the construction of this grand architectural project, be they engineers, artists, stonemasons, carpenters, or people who polish the brass doorknobs, should all be sons or daughters of Hungary. The city also demanded that the technology used in this scheme, as well as all of the building materials, could only be sourced from within Hungary's borders. Ebel readily dealt with these strict conditions and only had to apply for extraordinary permission on five occasions. The colored marble came from Carrara, the granite columns from Austria and the fine oak and cedar wood panelling came from Italy. While the technical component of the stage was based on a Viennese patent and the grand chandelier in the auditorium imported directly from Mainz. But absolutely everything else, from the foundation stone to the lighting conductor, was Hungarian and crafted into exquisite shape by Hungarian engineers, artists and artisans. Besides the architect Miklos Ibel, the musical director Ferenc Erkel and various state city functionaries, 
The grand opening was also attended by Emperor Franz Joseph himself. On stepping into the famous royal box, known as the Red Salon, he is claimed to have exclaimed, Die ist wirklich kleiner geworden. True, it is smaller than the Vienna Opera House, as I demanded, but at the same time much more beautiful, and I definitely did not demand that. As truth would have it, our Opera House is one of the most harmonious and well-proportioned Opera Houses in the world. It is virtually perfectly symmetrical, along both breadth and depth. On one side of the building, we find what used to be the Sovereign's private entrance. On the other side, the entrance for management and artists. Audiences flood into the building through the main entrance at the front, while props, scenery and all material required for a production come into the building via a mirrored entrance to the rear. The front part was built to welcome audiences with its entrance hall, grand staircase, balcony corridors, cloakrooms and the buffet bar. While the area at the back of the building is a completely different world, alive with movement and activity from morning to night and even during performances. This is where we find the offices, workshops, rehearsal halls, dressing rooms and storerooms. And when everything is eventually polished to perfection, these two worlds meet here in this glorious theatre that houses the vast stage and an auditorium climbing steeply to the gods. Isn't it spectacular? It When Franz Joseph, betrothed Queen Elizabeth, known and loved to Hungarians simply as Sisi, attended the opera alone, she did not sit in the royal box, but in the box of her own. She was able to access it through an elegantly decorated oak-panelled salon without coming into contact with a single soul. The intricate wooden inlay above the gigantic fireplace depicts the monogram IFJ, which is said to be the handiwork of the emperor Franz Joseph himself. Habsburg family tradition dictated that all the boys should study a trade, and His Imperial Highness managed to master the craft of carpentry. Stretching around the room, just below the ceiling, we can see a delightful frieze by Bertalan Seke, the master of Hungarian Romanticism, with cherubs playing joyfully through all four seasons of the year. This room now carries the great painter's name. From here, we enter the CC box that sits above the stage, forming a delicate detail in the side of the proscenium arch. Although the view of the stage and orchestra from here is far from perfect compared to the royal box, located in the centre of the balcony, it provided the awaiting audience with a much better view of the graceful queen's presence. Those preferring to watch a performance from a box also became a preferable part of the production. It is not only important to be visible, but to also have a clear vista of the other boxes to see how fellow opera goers are dressed and how they are behaving. Those who are able still insist on purchasing tickets for the same box, recreating the aura of an age when the truly wealthy not only lived in palaces and travelled around town in horse-drawn carriages, but also kept a box at the opera. These discreet boxes are rather like miniature apartments with an entrance and a sitting room that can be closed off by a curtain and a splendid view of the world outside from a spacious terrace. The balustrades and balconies were richly decorated with various motifs and grotesque figures all covered in 24 karat gold. A box at the Opera House is a place for social interaction at the highest levels where supper and champagne are served in the interval and especially enjoyed at the Opera Ball. Sitting above three balconies, we eventually come to the upper circle, where we find a completely different audience. At this height, we sit within arm's reach of the golden chandelier and can admire the artwork that adorns the sculptured ceiling. 
A particular delight are Karoi Lot's winged cherubs playing on various musical instruments with the cherub conductor standing in pride of place above the royal box. Legend has it that this cherubic orchestra strikes up at the stroke of midnight every night, playing a selection of sequences from that evening's performance and so ensuring that the acoustics of the opera house stay as superb as ever. It's true that the stage is very far from the upper circle. The sound up here is clearly much better. The people in these seats come mainly to enjoy a wonderful night of music at the opera, rather than stare at the stage or make a spectacle of themselves. Everyone seated at this great height is quite convinced that they are the truest opera experts and devotees. The whole performance can, of course, best be seen and heard by those sitting in the stalls. They, too, are convinced that they are the true opera audience and that the musicians, singers and dancers are playing primarily for their delight. Night after night, a grand total of 1,200 people are able to feel completely at home in the Opera House. And yet there is still one place that remains more personal and more exceptional than any other. From where every word and every note can be heard with crystal clarity, a tiny office facing the stage designed for one, the prompter's box. Professional Prompter knows all the great works of opera and has the honor of following every performance from beginning to end. And that is why all true enthusiasts of this art form would resign all the riches in the world to become a prompter at the Opera House. A prompter has the singular sensation that she or he is an intricate part of the complex machinery to be found several stories deep below the main stage. Until the most recent renovation of the Opera House, the original stage machinery, one of the miracles of the building, worked with absolute precision for nearly a hundred years. The great marvel of the so-called Asphelia system was that stage sets were not moved manually, but manipulated via a complex set of hydraulic levers. This revolutionary technology, used first in the world at the Opera House, was not only easy to control, perfectly precise and reliable, but it also raised and lowered incredibly heavy stage sets in total silence. It was considered an innovation in the era that instead of utilizing large amounts of flammable timber, the Asphelia stage system was manufactured entirely out of steel. Great consideration was given to fire prevention at the time of construction as the Ring Theatre in Vienna was burned to the ground by fire in 1881 with many hundreds of lives tragically lost to the flames. The majority of theatre fires start on the stage and yet it is the audience who are largely at risk. This is why an international committee ordered that every theatre should be fitted with an iron curtain which was a steel framework filled with sand. Weighing a staggering 16 tons, the Opera House's iron curtain could be lowered in little more than 10 seconds and had the strength to hold a blaze on the stage for up to an hour and a half. Located directly above the Iron Curtain, 
we find a series of water tanks that make up the deluge system. If a fire takes place, then eight enormous tanks can flood the stage with a bewildering 60,000 litres of water. Such a downpour could cause drastic damage to the instruments in the orchestra pit as well as the stage machinery. But if a fire is not put out in time, it could result in the swift destruction of a priceless building and an incalculable loss of human life. It is fortunate that such a catastrophe has never occurred. In fact, it was the Opera House that saved the lives of hundreds of innocent citizens when Budapest was bombarded with bombs in the Second World War. Its subterranean cellars were converted into shelters and supplied with water and electricity. Many members of the company weathered the terrors of war in the safety of these cellars. Of course, Miklos Ibel didn't design the cellars to be used as bomb shelters, but to help ventilate, heat and cool the opera house. Fresh air entered the building via air ducts that opened in the street outside. After passing through a fine water mist to remove dust particles, fresh air then passed into the auditorium via vents under the seats and openings in the side walls. The stale, warm air inside the opera house naturally made its way upwards and exited through the grills arranged at the base of the chandelier. The same ventilated air could be heated on its way into the building in colder weather and chilled with blocks of frozen ice in the hot summer months. It is true that fire and water both pose a real threat to the Opera House, but it is also true that everyone expects to be stunned by all things imaginable on stage, including towers of flame, roaring fires, whirlwinds, snowstorms, wild seas, flying dragons or fairy tale giants. Stage sets created in the scenery workshops are moved on and off stage by either lowering them below ground level or lifting them up out of sight into the rigging loft that continues for another 40 meters above the stage. In total, this provides an area large enough to accommodate a 10-storey building or a village church. Most of the scenery required can be lowered from this great height in a matter of seconds, between acts or even as audiences watch. The wigs, costumes and shoes worn by singers are all manufactured in the dedicated workshops. The Opera House actually houses an extensive wardrobe department where hundreds of cupboards and closets provide storage for aprons, belts, blazers, boots, braces, capes, court shoes, cravats, crowns, frock coats, furs, galoshes, handkerchiefs, jackets, jodhpurs, pullovers, pyjamas, sandals, scarves, shawls, shorts, slippers, socks, stockings, suits, ties, top hats, trench coats, trousers and tunics. While performers don their costumes and have the finishing touches added to their hair and makeup, the members of the audience arrive similarly prepared for a night at the opera. They hand their outside coats in at the cloakroom and hang their hats on hooks in their box before adding the finishing touches to their evening hair and makeup. The audience become a part of the evening's performance long before they enter the auditorium and wait for the curtain to go up. Every single element of decoration, both inside and outside the opera house, every painting, mosaic, statue, sculpture, and item of furniture reflects the incomparable wealth of Europe's tradition in music, reflecting every aspect of music, whether that be rhythm, harmony, orchestration, particular musical works, musicians, or composers.
Statues of 16 famous composers stand in a long line on a ledge that runs across the top of the Opera House's grand façade. The statues we see today have only been in place since 1965, as the originals were fashioned from softer stone and had crumbled and cracked by the 1930s, one actually falling from its prestigious perch. It is strange to see that the two great opera composers, Puccini and Richard Strauss, are missing from their ranks, or at least for the time being. And neither is it worth searching for the two Hungarian giants of 20th century music, Béla Bartók and Zoltán Kodály, on this stone perimeter because the statues of these local maestros are positioned to welcome visitors at the entrance to the opera house. Ferenc Erkel and Ferenc Liszt, modeled in person for the 26-year-old sculpture Olajos Strobel, who carved their life-size likenesses from limestone. Strobel statues perfectly capture the strikingly different personalities of the renowned composers with Liszt assuming an artistic pose, while Erkel's figure exudes an air of natural calm. The iconic stone sphinxes that guard the opera house on either side of the entrance are also the works of Olajos Strobel. One of these mysteriously dignified figures with the lower body of a lion and the upper body of a woman clasps a laurel wreath between its claws while the other clutches a theatrical mask. The wreath and the mask are designed to represent a Polonian and Dionysian dimensions of human existence. Influenced by the works and thoughts of the great 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, the Greek gods Apollon and Dionysos were commonly depicted in connection with the creative arts and especially the world of music. Apollon, known by the Romans as Apollo, is the god of order, the sun, poetry, joy, music, dance and the arts. Dionysus, known in Roman mythology as Bacchus, is the god of wine, intoxication, and pleasures of the flesh. Greek theatre was created in honour of this god. The opposing characters of Apollon and Dionysus are depicted with equal emphasis in paintings within and around the opera house. They both battle and complement one another, and in doing so reflect the duality of music, as well as the conscious, the sublime, and perfection in both its performance and enjoyment, and its entrancing, sensuous, and irrational nature. When the audience ascend the staircases situated at either side of the entrance hall, they are slowly greeted with the spectacle of the ball-strated grand staircase that will eventually carry them into the emotional heart of the building. Expanses of pale, cold marble give even greater pomp to the space, the festive feel of which is heightened still further by the theme of Mortan's paintings that adorn the ceiling, presenting the awakening and power of music. These pictures appear thronged with cherubs praising Apollon, as well as the deity himself, who, with the help of pure harmony and the muses, stands victorious over the wild and wondrous forces of nature. And as we scale the grand staircase, we reach the first floor and the foyer, where members of the audience can seek light refreshment in the intermission and chat over a wide selection of sandwiches, delicious cakes, or drinks. Opening onto the foyer, we find the oak-panelled smoker's corridor that was added to the rear of the grand terrace above the main entrance by the then-intendant Miklos Banfi when the opera house was first renovated. This was a place where audience members could enjoy a cigarette or cigar as they debated the merits of the performance, or through a thick cloud of smoke, they could also exchange a quiet word. It is therefore no wonder that a place designed to accommodate such earthly pleasures did not have Apollon looking down from the ceiling, but his hedonistic fellow deity, Dionysus. The pictorial theme of Apollon and Dionysus is brought together in Karoi Lotz's circular composition entitled The Transfiguration of Music on the ceiling of the Opera House Auditorium. Measuring an amazing 45 meters in circumference, this neo-baroque ceiling mural depicts Olympus, 
A striking figure in the piece is Apollon, who sits atop clouds as he strums a lyre, surrounded by various gods delighting in the beauty of his music. Caroi Lotz modeled Aphrodite, the goddess of love, on his own daughter, while her father, the mighty Zeus, is said to be a self-portrait. Opposing Apollon on the other side of the ceiling, we see Dionysus in the company of gathering demigods. So the main axis of the painting are balanced between the two extremes of human nature, with the worlds of intellectual purity and sensual instinct set to both oppose and complement each other. And in the center of this stunning masterpiece hangs a gigantic bronze chandelier patterned with leaf motifs. The three-ton chandelier originally bore 500 gaslights, but these flickering flames led to a build-up of soot on the ornate ceiling. So electric cables were threaded through the gas pipes in 1895, and the gas flames were exchanged for modern electric light bulbs. And ever since then, the lights have been slowly dimmed to indicate a performance is about to begin. Let's begin. Yeah. 